So the plan was just to finish up or I was going to do mm -hmm. 11.8, kind of start over at 11.8 and finish that up. And then we can do some um, uh, exercises. Ryan's got a couple and then I got the last one. I think I'm going to do, if there's time, I'll do um, 11 point, I lost it already. Where the last one is, mm -hmm. cross-validation, 11.10. Um, well, I'm not convinced really. I mean, it might be good to get to you because I'm not convinced I'm doing it right. I'm still like, Oh yeah, believe me. Not, not seeing what I expect necessarily, but or the fits are just terrible. I don't know which one it is. But. So I'll go ahead and share my screen yeah. again. As always, please stop me, interrupt or whatever, because I do tend to mm -hmm. get caught up in uh, my notes. I noticed looking at the embarrassing YouTube recordings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, book club, book club. What I should also do when I do this is close all my extra windows because then I can find which one I'm supposed to share faster. Okay, hopefully you can see the book down mm -hmm. set on chapter uh, section 11.8. And the idea of this section was to we want to try to find some way to compare different models, right? And we can't do the ideal thing, which we'd like to do with external validation because we don't have new data. We just have to use the data we have. And the kind of tried and true approach that is used for this is cross validation, where you fit on a portion of your data and then predict on the portion you left out. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're doing a five fold cross validation, you would divide your data up randomly into five uh, subsets and then fit on four test on the fifth and then cycle around all the possibilities there, right? So uh, that's that's that. Um, the, of course, the most redundant, most uh, degenerate, <laughs> degenerate, that's probably the wrong word, but I'm um, thinking in a mathematical sense, the most degenerate way of doing that is to leave one out where you just have, leave out one data point, fit it with all the rest and then do a test on that out of sample uh, element that you left out. And then there's some advanced methods, which we're not gonna talk about here, but are useful to be aware of. Oh, Amma, yes. Um, so the leave one out, that one, you don't have to plan ahead that, oh, I'm going to like do the 70, 30 kind of thing, but the K-fold, you sort of have to plan that I'm going to, or that one too, you can test with all your data and then, cause you just you keep changing the fold that you use, right? Right. So you plan ahead in the sense you decide what kind of fold you're going to use. I mean, 10 fold is fairly common. Um, or fivefold if it takes a long time, but tenfold is fairly common. I don't know why. I guess it just it experience. It seems to work well. And so okay. you fit on nine tenths of the data, and then you test on the last tenth, and then you fit on. Then you put that tenth back in. You take out another tenth, and you you know go through all ten possibilities. You end up with ten different fits. Uh, and that way, every okay. single data point has an out of sample prediction that you can then compare with the actual truth, right? Okay. So you. For your first fold, you plan that I'm going to do the 90, 10 kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You just want to divide it up into K chunks, you know, whatever K is. Don't get confused with the um, the final, often people, this is called, this is validation. There's also a kind of final test holdout that people often do too. Like you might have, let's say you take all your data, you might hold out, let's say 30% you don't even touch at all. You leave that to the end. When you've done all your model comparison, you've done everything you can do, you pick, this is the model I'm gonna use. Then you go with that last holdout data and you do it. That's kind of the, the philosophy I've heard. You go that last holdout data, then you do a final test on that. Yeah. And the reason for that, cause you tend to, as you do the different validation and model comparison, you tend to tune your model now to your verification set. You get over an overfit of a second order, so to speak. Um, so that's that's another issue which he doesn't discuss here as far as I can tell, but. Um, Oh, so like you still have to do 70% and that 70% becomes your new 100%. Right. And then you do all this validation, cross-validation with that. Oh, right. okay. Okay. That's that's so, what I learned from other books. I don't think this is in here, but or maybe it wasn't. I kind of forgot about it, but yeah. Was it in here? Did anyone else? Did you catch that, Ryan? Mm -hmm. Were they no. No, but I would just say this. You like know what I'm talking about, though. That's the thing that people generally do, right? Yeah, except I would only, it's funny, like this whole idea of cross-validation is, um, I mean, a lot of people do like training training and test sets, you know, but they don't necessarily call it cross-validation. Um, 
Um, but yeah, I guess you know basically the the impetus is the same, which is to um, you know to have some data that you sort of learn on, and then some data that you use to kind of verify what you've learned. If you know if it's if it's yeah. wildly different, then you know obviously. But yeah, it's funny. People don't call that cross validation. They just call it like actually a lot of times they call it machine learning. You know what I mean? Like that's that's kind of like what machine learning is sometimes. Is right. I mean, like what's done is you have a you do a test train split usually, right? So you have your test data. Then that test data is you you leave that way, put that way somewhere. Now your training data, you'll do your model comparison on. But to do that, you'll use cross validation with your training data. So you'll be doing this. Mm. That's what I'm saying. So uh yeah. huh uh huh because. You compare like three models yeah. using your cross. Yeah, because if you compare, like, let's say you can start comparing like 50 models, right? But if you're using your test data for that, you're certainly going to pick the model that now performs best on that particular test data, which is not what you really wanted, right? So you're, oh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I forget there's a name for it. I forgot, but. So, like, you have three models, you do your cross validation on your three models, you get your best model, and then you use that on your, yeah. your test. Yeah. Data. To do to final evaluation. How well it does. And I expect people aren't that, you know, uh, hygienic about it. Sometimes they maybe they'll go to the test day. Oh, wait a minute. I thought of a better thing to do. And they'll go back to the, you know, they'll, they'll probably test other test data maybe more than once and not completely hygienic. But, um, but you do want to worry about, you know, spoiling your, how did uh, somebody put it? How you spend your test data, right? <laughs> Yeah, you exactly. spend all your data. How you spend it, right? It's a little, there's a little, there's some optimizations or at least some kind of trade-offs involved there, which I don't really feel like I have a good solid handle on yet. But I think it, my cop-out answer is it, can, it depends on the particular thing you're trying to solve. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start with the uh, leave one out cross validation, mainly because that's the. Um, it turns out that there's an optimal way to do it, a shortcut way to do it for these Bayesian models, um, or at least for calculating this one particular uh, metric, the EPLD. The oh, e, it's not EPLD. It's not. Okay. It's, ELPD. EL, it's ELPD. <laughs> anyway, now you've you know, ruined it. The, the whole thing is like, ruined it. This, might just, well just burn, you might as well might as well burn the whole file. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've done it several times with you enough. Yeah. Ron is so hard on himself for like these little, <laughs> these little typos. It's like, yeah, I, I, that's that's like the best part of what I do, let alone. You know. Anyway, yeah, it's the this is like a, a whole new lingo we are learning. It is. It certainly is. Yeah. So this is called the expected log predictive density, and there, these notes are, by the way, I, I've been pushed online. So if you want to look at them, including the typos, um, you can. And there's a paper there if you want to go into more detail about how uh, how it works. But the basic idea, or I should say, um, in the book, it talks about it more general. But this is a not as general way of understanding it, but it is understanding it from the point of view of the e, uh, the Lou, the Lee went out optimization. And so I like this because it's a concrete implementation of how you would calculate this uh, expected log probability density. And so what it is, is you so we're going to leave one out. So we're going to fit our data on everything except for one data point. Then we make a prediction for that one data point. And we ask, what is the posterior probability of that prediction? Right? So in other words, how surprising is it? Is it way out in the wings? Well, then how did that happen? If it's not, or is it toward the center? Then, okay, that's, that prediction matches our model pretty well. Um, and then we take the log of it and add them all up. And that's the expected log predictive density. And that particular form of it is, has some uh, information theoretic justifications beyond, um, you know, why take the log? Well, it turns out that it's closer to something called the KL divergence or at least part of the KL divergence. So it's, it's kind of how, how different the true distribution of the data is versus the predicted distribution of the data. Uh, how, and it's a common method of measuring that. But for us, it's just a score. It's some kind of score. And the nice thing about it is that the, um, uh, the Bayesian people have figured out a way to shortcut that. You don't have to actually brute force it like you could do here. So this, I do have this code, this example. Um, this takes a, about five minutes, which doesn't sound like a long time, but you know, when you're 
late for something that's the last thing you <laughs> run away so we talked oh, about last... you're testing like 20 models for sure right yeah that's yeah, yeah. models exactly you're not gonna that's now you've got an hour or more in, or two hours into your project there and then you find out something's wrong you have to do it again so it gets five minutes is a long time for doing something on a computer we can agree to that so i just do this by hand here just leave one out where I just go, I'm just going through every row in this kid IQ data that we've talked about before. This is the kid score, how well the kid scored on a test. And we're looking at a model that uh, tries to do a linear regression with the mom's, was the mom, did the mom finish high school? And what's the mom, mom's IQ, right? That's what we're doing the fit on. And what I'm, but I'm using for the, now for each path through this loop, I am, the data I'm fitting on is this, it's kid IQ minus I. So I'm leaving out the row in the data set that is for this uh, that I'm doing the leave one out on, right? So I'm leaving out one row and I'm leaving out a different row every single time, right? Uh, and I fit on that, all the rest of the data except for that one row. I know I'm being redundant the way I'm saying it, but I just mm -hmm. I figure one of these ways will be understandable. <laughs> it's a shotgun approach <laughs> to, to, to speaking that I sometimes fall into. The, uh, then I'm going to do a prediction. I'm using Lin predict here because I don't want, um, I do want to know all the different, I do want to include all the different possible slopes, right? Uh, I want to use the posterior distribution of the slopes, but I don't want to include the final noise aspect because I'm going to do that by myself when I look at the log predictive density, right? In other words, I want this part of this thing, probably a theta given the data, and this part is what I'm going to actually calculate directly, mm -hmm. okay? So this is what this part does. And then I'm going to, then, I, I, so I asked also for what the sigmas were. That's a, that's a list of Bayesian draws of this of the sigma too as well, right? And then now, uh, just forget this line. This just so that can, this is, this is the kind of thing you put in when your code takes too long. You're like, well, is it running? I don't know. They put something in there, so I'll spit out something once in a while. That's what that is. Hmm. And uh, finally, I just calculate now this log predictive density, right? So it's a normal distribution with that, with that sigma. Uh, the difference between my prediction and the actual result from that row of data, which I didn't use the fit with, right? So this is out of sample, right? That's a call it sometimes. But, um, and that's what I'm doing. I'm just by hand doing exactly what's up in here and I'm taking a log of it. And when I sum all those together, I get minus 1876. If you remember that number, because in a minute, I'm gonna show you how we can do the shortcut all this very quickly and we'll get the same answer, which is satisfying if you wrote code like this and you're actually surprised it works like I am. <laughs> So it all worked. Uh, another thing to, to note is we have, because we're predicting this over and over again for every row, notice I said some scores, so I'm doing a score for every row. So I've got, now I've got um, uh, N row different scores, right? And I need to sum them all together. That's what I'm doing there. But I can also take the standard deviation of them, right? So I've got N row realizations of this score and I can ask what the standard deviation is and then we get 14. So that's important too, because we want to know how well we understand that score, when we go to compare two scores, how otherwise how can we compare them? Is it off by 10? Is that important or is it just random chance? We don't know. The standard thing you need to do, right? Um, let's see, why is this here? I don't know, okay, I forget that. So uh, fortunately, our stand has a function that does this for you in one line. So you just do the fit and then you just call Lou on the fit, boom. It spits out the Lou, spits out the standard error and note 1876, hey, what do you know? I passed that test on learning, on doing some R programming. <laughs> and standard error 14? Yes. Okay. So they're doing the same thing I'm doing, but it's amazing because this actually is not doing that. This loop function is not doing what I just did. It's not looping through every row and leaving one out and doing a fit. It's going through some shortcut thing based on the probability theory itself of, of what the loop actually, what the ELPD is. I said it right, ELPD, yes. And how does that work? I don't know. The book talks about it a little bit. I kind of just like whoosh, right over my head, but there is a paper. You can look at it. You probably never will because I know I won't, but <laughs> if you ever really want to know how it works, <laughs> it's possible to find out. <laughs> there are some uh, issues with it. Sometimes it doesn't work. So that's why it gives out this little statistic, whatever this means. All these pair to K estimates are good. All you want to do is see that line come out and you're happy. If you don't see that line out, the book recommends switching to your uh, manual, uh, well, not manual, but switching to k-fold uh, validation, which there is a built-in function for that as well. 
Okay. So that's the that's the point. Of that. So the main thing for doing this for though is not just oh, what's the LPD of that? It's eighteen minus eighteen seventy six. Okay, good, you did it. We're done. No, the point is we want to compare a couple of different models, and that's you don't. Have, in other words, don't care about the actual number. It doesn't really matter. Only thing you care about is comparisons between these numbers. Does one model do a better job than another model? So, for example, I compared uh, this model. Now I only fit on that that uh, categorical variable. Did the mom finish high school? I forget about mom's IQ. We'll fit that as well. And I didn't even bother spitting out the loop because I'm going to immediately compare the two, uh, leave one out, um, ELPDs. And that's what this loop compare will spit out. So it tells me, uh, it gives one row for every model. You can do more than two models. So it'll just spit out one row for every model. And it'll, whatever one did best, it, it, scale, it uh, uh, subtracts it from all the rest. So this one's zero now. And this one's 40 worse. It's 40 mm. worse if you leave that out. Okay, what does that mean? Is that mm. significant? Well, that's what this is for. This tells us the standard of the difference. And yes, it is. Okay, so it, it makes one of it the reference and then subtracts the other ones, like yeah. compares the other ones to the reference. Yeah, the reference is always the one with the, the highest loop, the highest score, the best one in some sense, right? Okay. The highest ELPD. So, so like it, it was negative. So like yes. a, a lower negative number will be highest. Like, Lower like negative numbers normal. are worse, yeah. Right. Or you mean lower in absolute value? Yes, lower in absolute value yeah. is better. Right, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. correct. Okay. So this says that FIT3 is significantly better from the point of view of ELPD, and that would be the model to pick, right? That's what that says. It's very significantly better, right? Because it's many times the standard deviation there or standard error. When you do get a problem with your Puerto K estimates, whatever that is, I forgot. The book does say it, but whatever. It's a it's a message. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't mean to be flippant, but I forgot, and I, I I don't know what it is. And the most important thing about it is you get a warning that tells you that hey, let's try some k-fold cross validation, and so we can do that as well. Um, we can do it manually. We can just you know assign uh, each each row, not roll, <laughs> each row to a uh, random fold and that's all I'm doing here and then um, do a fit right I knew I did this before I was trying I was looking for code where I did this k-fold thing before and here it is hmm. uh, in any event um, I'll, I had this row number here just so I can assign I can save this is probably not the best way to do it you'll see if we get to the exercise 11.9 I did it a completely different way <laughs> which or 11.10 I mean I did it a totally different way I don't know which is better. This is our, I can, this is like read once, read only because I'm not sure what I was doing here. Um, so here what I'm doing is, what is this? Oh, I see. You're, you're taking numbers one through 10. Over and over again. And then I'm sampling it and then shoving that into a new column in the kid IQ called fold. So I've assigned kid IQ a new column which just randomly assigns them to a fold, but equally. That's what's going on there. Huh, that's, that's wild. You'll see if you get to eleven point ten, you'll see I did this in a different way. It's a little bit cleaner, I think, but that's one way to do it. Um, so all this does is randomly shuffle. So I, let me explain the words. Like I'm just just repeating one through ten uh, as many times as it takes to fill up the whole thing, right? And actually a little bit too many because there's, there's not exactly divided by ten. And mm -hmm. then I'm shuffling them. That's what sample does here. Basically shuffles them, mm -hmm. and then I'm. Now I'm only truncating, so I'm leaving off a few at the end. So one of some of the folds won't have a full amount. There's nothing you can do about that. That happens when you do k-fold validation. And then I'm just adding a row number here, just so when I take a particular uh, subfold subset, I can assign the answers back into the original thing. I that's probably not the best way to do it, but it's the only way I can figure out how to do it when I did this. Yeah. In fact, you'll see I did it a different way in the other exercise because I forgot all about this. And so this is a tenfold. So I'm just going through one through ten. I'm going to fit. Uh, again, I'm going to fit. This is this part here just says leave out everything except for the fold that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Okay, to fit to it. And then the test data is the stuff that's in that fold, right? So this is the train data. Mm -hmm. This is the test data. Everything in the fold, fold, and that I'm using that column fold to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to grab all the sigma random sigma values from this fit result and then i'm going to go through 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's probably a way to do that loop, but I didn't loop. I'm just going to go through every row in the test data and uh, predict what the data is, right? Predict the same thing I did before with the loop, but now I'm doing it in, for more data. Calculate the, uh, the log predictive probability density here and add it into that row. Uh, and then finally, I'm using rows update to shove this, um, this thing into the kid IQ data frame hmm. as a score. This, this is online, so if you know if it, if it if it's wrong, you can correct me. If it's uh, yeah, but in the end, all I really want is a sum of the expected log probability density, and that's what this is: eighteen seventy seven, eighteen seventy seven point four six. I can do the same thing before: get the standard deviation, calculate the standard error. Uh, all these things are fine, but again, this is just the point of this code is: if you want to go back and look at it, you should. Um, look at to make sure you understand how the k-fold works it could probably be clear code but it's an example there's probably better examples online you don't need to do that though because hey guess what there's a function called k-fold mm -hmm. and it will do it for you and uh, by defaults to 10 folds you can change the number of folds if you want to and you can just say hey do me a comparison well, here's no sorry here's the k-fold elpd computed by the k-fold function and my value is not exactly the same, but close enough. I mean, it, it all depends on randomness of how the folds get split. Um, actually, I'm surprised or not. I thought they were identical. That's why I did this set C twice. But anyway, doesn't matter. They're close enough uh, within this, definitely within errors. Uh, so the k-fold function M is doing the same thing Michael was doing. It's the only part of that. Mm -hmm. And again, you can do what's weird is now you can do the same thing with fit one. Let me do before when I compare those two fits again. And I can then do it's weird. You actually use the same function loop compare uh, for K fold, but that's what you do. That confused me for a while. I'm like, where's, where's the K compare? No, there's no mm -hmm. there's loop compare again. And you get the similar results actually, it turns out with K fold, which is not surprising because we in the, in the one we just did. Uh, with the loo, it didn't give us any errors. It said it was fine. So whatever that Pareto approximation was, it was working fine here. Uh, yes, Ama. So we got the same errors, like the negative 38 and the... Yeah. Yeah, we did. And that's not a surprise because like I said, the glue didn't give any errors. So we shouldn't expect, we should expect similar results for the loo versus the K-fold. We're doing the same comparison, the same two models. It would have been, uh, a surprise if they were different, unless there was yeah. some error. Because uh, even the the negative eighteen seventy six is almost the same as the first one. Yeah. 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 So what was the p fold and the k fold? I that one we don't touch it. The book does talk about what these are, and I already forgot what they were. Um, this K fold IC is the K fold information criteria thing. I forget what that is. It's some, something, it's related mathematics. I think it's like twice this, twice two, this negative or something like that. It's not, it's not an independent thing. Some people like using this, some people like using that. Uh, and I don't remember uh -huh. what this one is at all. Probably P K fold. I don't know. The book does talk about it. I didn't internalize it. Somebody <laughs> wants to look it up. They can, but I don't have the book here. Thank you. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying I didn't, um, <laughs> didn't remember. He seemed to not be too interested in spending a lot of time on it. But just for completeness, let's just see what it is. Now it's going to bother me. Cross validation. P Lu is the estimated effective number. Oh yeah. So that's the effective number of, of parameters in the model. So that what that's saying is that um, my model has effectively four parameters, I guess, but you said in models with more stronger priors or weaker data or model misspecification, this, this direct identification will not always work with the uh, thing. So I guess if you see this number is a lot smaller than the number of parameters in your model, you might think that there's something wrong with your model. I don't know. I should have said that because that might not be true. <laughs> Let's forget about that. This needs further study. Yeah. I guess. 
finally, we have this wonderful poem about EBLT. <laughs> I had to put it here. Did I they, asked, they, did I you ask BLT to do this? Yeah, just for the fun of it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny, even kind of Bayesian loop thing. The ELPLD can, ELPD can estimate in different ways. You can choose cross-validation or Bayesian Lou. Whichever method you choose to use, remember that ELPD is just one clue. <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? That's crazy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All I said is write a poem about ELPD. I spelled it correctly that time. I didn't do the opposite way. Yeah. Okay, so that's that. Now, I guess uh, we'll hand it over to Ryan. He can entertain us with his yeah, I just well, I I, I I since like I said I was sick, I um I did some work. Hold on, let me um get. Uh... We're on. Uh, this is like a uh, interlude week, so we got time. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. All oh, right, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yes. So I just worked on 11.6 and then I tried to work in 11.9, um, but I didn't get very far. So, okay, so in 11.6, suppose you have 100 data points that arose from the following model, intercept equals three, and then there's two, I'm calling them X1 and X2, point one and point five are the um, coefficients, and then there's some kind of an error that we need to estimate from the T distribution, which, um, yeah, with a mean of zero, scale five. I've never heard of anyone saying this before, by the way. Have you ever, like, do you ever hear anyone say that scale is equal to five on a distribution? Ron? Yeah, that's that's common, at least in the, I know in the Python world, that's common because a lot of the distributions, they don't have a proper um, standard deviation things, like we'll say scale. Yeah, anyway, well, that was confusing to me, but okay, so, um, and then four degrees of freedom. So the first thing we got to do is simulate the data. Um, so basically, what they oh, wait, ask, are you are you showing us the book? You mean to show us your R Studio, probably? Oh yeah. Oh sorry, you're not looking at that. Oh sorry. Okay. Well, that that probably helps. Hold on. Hold on. Um, how about that. Yep. Now we got it. I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my bad. Um, okay. Yeah. So this I'm just I'm just talking about, <laughs> just talking about this was. Yeah, my bad. I, I really thought I had you guys. Um, so this is the formula that I'm trying to like back engineer a data set for, right? Right. So, okay, so I'm calling the variables x1 and x2. Um, they, they want, um, oh, sorry, this this is, should say x1. For some reason, when you copy and paste stuff from PDF. Yeah, I noticed that too. G, are simply the integers one through 100, so that's easy. And the values of x2 are random and likely, equally likely to be um, zero or one. So, um, Anyway, I plug in all of the numbers and yeah, X1 is easy because it's just one through 100, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that's just how you would you would do it, right? Yes. Yeah. And then um, I'm using our binome to um, give me a coin flip and I plug in my D yeah. degrees of free with the RT function, which I've never done that before. I've never, I'm not familiar with RT function like this and using it like this. So uh, anyway, yeah, that's, that's how I got, um, with NCP? What's that? With NCP? Oh, it's the non, um, it's the, the non, non central parameter, right? Okay. Yeah, non central parameter. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. I forgot about that. Um, uh, of course, I didn't do my re thing. Uh, Ron, anyway, here's, yeah, so here's now my, um, the, 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 the method here. We have 0.1 and 1.7. Um, and, so basically, like the, the the thing that they wanted us to do is to try to figure out, like, you know, how if to do this, like, to do this whole process in a loop, and see, like, how often we would get the actual um, um, estimates within, like, you know, right, six, the coefficients. Yeah, right. yeah. So um, now this is just doing it once, right? So I did it once on just this. You know, they, they were in there, right? But now I'm going in and saying do this a thousand times right that I, the thing that i just said and i'm not i'm, I'm not going to run that because i just ran it a bunch but this is what happens when you uh 64.2 percent of the time 
we um this, by the way this is just for the x1 i, I you, there's there's you can do this for um any of the um estimates but i was like you know i just wanted to tr try out for one because it's um yeah i'm just doing b1 which is the the estimate yeah the that's fine yeah me. yeah so this is so this this um basically it's a loop where you're going through it and you're fitting this model and then you're taking that data and you're fitting making creating a um a, a uh, fake data set you're then fitting it and I'm saying give me the uh, beta one hat and beta standard errors and then use that to give me you know what the um what right. the, uh, the, the 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 coverage for the 68 percent 95 percent so yeah so we're, we're pretty dang close yeah so what are we supposed to learn from that I mean I mean I guess just to show that empirically like you know this stuff does work you know what I mean like the you know it's like the whole thing of like you know the 95 percentile it's like you know you, you find out that the confidence interval is in fact does does include um you know the parameter like 95 percent of the time but we're fitting the wrong model right that was the point yeah so the point is we're fitting the wrong model we, we generate this model with this t distribution these long tails yeah and when we fit we're not we're not telling the stand anything special it's still going to use a normal distribution for the residuals oh so i think the point here that? was even because he says before it doesn't really matter he says don't worry about it if you have the wrong distribution it all works out i think that's what he's trying to demonstrate here like see it still works you get the right coverage even though you're using a normal distribution when you should be using a you know the t distribution here well no oh you're no 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 i am I'm, this is this is the uh no you're generating the data oh. with the t distribution but you're fitting it with a normal distribution oh i see what you're saying that's what yeah. the wrong model part is Right. I don't know if it's possible to tell Stan GLM to use a team. Well, there's a way to do a Stan, but I don't know if Stan GLM can do it. But um, I think that was the point of that. He has another exercise like that too, where he does the same thing, but with even worse, like two, you know, two a mixture model or two Gaussians or something. It still surprisingly works really well. I think the reason why is that even though the residual model is wrong, your mm. your coefficients are still like some linear combination of all the outcomes, and so a lot mm. of large numbers still comes into effect. Mm. So the parameters are still more or less normally distributed in the posterior distribution, even though your um, your um, mm. data errors aren't. Right. And so you don't you you can still use the wrong. The point I guess the point was he says in the beginning of the chapter, don't worry about how does he say it? it? Doesn't say don't worry about. He says assumptions. The least important assumption, right, is normality of errors. Right. This use error term is irrelevant is relevant when predicting individual data points. But for the purpose of estimating regression line and coefficients, it's barely important at all. And that's what we're seeing here. It's barely important at all. It didn't matter that we used the wrong hmm. error model. I, well, that's what I got out of that. I'm glad you did because, yeah, I like I said, I, <laughs> I, I, I just did this for a bit like after we talked this morning. So I, I haven't had much of a chance. So, but yeah, anyway, I do think that was pretty cool that, you know, we're, we're coming within the hair's breadth of being, you know, in that coverage or whatever. But it's, it is, you're right. Like it is, I hadn't thought about that um okay so then uh the next one i i i did even less work on unfortunately it's, this is from 10 6 which is um this was a data set about evaluating the beauty of instructor and course evaluations and um yeah so i i've never used i haven't when i started when i learned there was no such thing as the loo package so um yeah i uh I just uh, it's as far as I got I I, I don't know what um, I, I I still haven't um, I mean I know you just talked through some of this stuff but you, anything you can take away from from this the point is you there is nothing you could take away from it right you need to fit like more common you did one model you should try you know different combinations of like should I use beauty and oh, right, stuff, yeah. or should I use and come up with several different models to try yeah well, I didn't get to that unfortunately. So <laughs> then you compare the the model. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's as far as I got. I apologize. Um, like no, I said, it's good that you got pretty similar Lou to what I got for that at least. Mm -hmm. um, what did what did you fit for that Lou one? Was it everything? Oh, it was just it was just uh, oh beauty. just beauty. Okay, so what did I get for that? I'm just curious. So I did, I did do just beauty. I called it. Um, Fit number three, I think. Okay, if I didn't do that. Why did I do that? Oh, no. 
I didn't do that fit, so I don't know. I don't have that for fit. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I um, yeah, I it's just close wouldn't... to the point is it's actually is close to the other ones though. Yeah, the beauty seems to give you a lot of it. Right. So um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. From the point of view with the six, when you put any causative uh, causal relationships in there, you may not like the uh, conclusions. Yeah. Well, that was it. That's all I had though. So. Um, well, good. I would like to just show quickly um, yeah. if, if there's time to yeah, we got my attempt at, at this stuff. Where is it? Is this it? No. One of these things is our studio. Which one is it? This one? Hmm. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you see our studio. Yeah. Oh. You just move over. Okay. Yes, we see our studio. So here I just, again, read in the um, beauty data. Now here you can see what it looks like. It's got an evaluation from some independent evaluators. Um, I'm sorry, so evaluation from the students and this beauty thing is from some independent evaluators. <laughs> I don't know what kind right. of job that is. <laughs> Come in here and rate these instructors. Oh, there's um, probably, you probably can do it. Like there, there are people that do that with like, um, probably you probably can do it with a computer now, like with like symmetry detection. Oh, that's true. And then there's a factor about whether they're female, how old they are, whether they're a minority, whether they're non-English. I guess that means non-English is the first language. I'm not sure whether it's a lower course and what the actual course was. So we're going to ignore most of those. Um, and just, just looking at beauty by itself and female or not female, this is what it looks like. You don't really see a super. There's like some maybe some soft trend here. I would say that the uh, the the the. Uh um uh, yeah i was gonna say like it feels like the the, the slope for the ones is a bit flatter i can't really yeah. put it. it's tough yeah so it doesn't look like there's much there not uh, that much there yeah which is kind of a good thing but nevertheless we can go and fit it like you did here i just did like this big fit all i called it i don't know i just didn't do i didn't i didn't do fit all all i didn't because i didn't want everything so mm -hmm. I specifically wrote out, it's not really all, it's mm -hmm. female times beauty, which includes the interactions, it's age, it's minority, it's not only that, just whether it's a lower or upper mm -hmm. thing. And I did that fit. And just looking at the coefficients, you can see some of these things probably don't matter that much, right? I mean, beauty seems to be the one that has the most significance, female also. Everything else, at least according to this, doesn't seem, I'm not looking at the correlations and everything, but just from a first glance, it looks like we should focus on beauty and female, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe non-English seems to have a, a negative impact. Um, so I calculate the loo for that. Again, it's not of any, what's this console thing saying? Oh, computer from 4,000, okay, whatever. Uh, oh, that's important, we gotta look at that. All Piero K is there. Yeah. Okay, so if minus 368 is what I got for the best, like, like trying to include everything. And then I'm like, then I tried some other things. I'm just gonna you look at just beauty and female. Those are the ones I thought were probably the most important. I get a loop for that. Skipping past that, there's a loop for that. We'll compare them later. Um, I also looked at beauty and interactions with females. So that's all three possibilities, right? Um, the interactions plus the individual ones. Uh, and then I finally looked at um, this last model where I I looked, I decided not to include the interaction on this one because it didn't seem important um, here, right? Mm. I guess that I mean, doesn't look that unimportant. But anyway, I left it out for this model. It doesn't really matter for three. Just beauty, female, and non-English, okay? And those three, all three seem like they have some significance, right, to the fit. The sigmas are big, but we expect that. And we get a final Lou 3. So then I'm going to compare all these different models. Lou compare, Lou all, mm. Lou 3, Lou 2, Lou 1. You probably forgot what they all were. <laughs> The interesting thing is the big, the winner here, not the big winner, but the winner seems to be fit three. Can you go back up to that? What fit that three was? was so. That included beauty, female, and non-English, just additive. Okay. Huh. So those three, that was the best. Uh, is and within this is, real, is this real data? Do we know or not? I yeah, guess. it is real data. Oh wow. And then I compared that to the fit all. It's, fit all is not significantly different. I might as well use the simpler model, right? And then these other ones are just barely significant. I mean, it's like, you know, minus, if I just do fit, fit one was the simplest one I did, which I think was just beauty plus female. Yeah, fit one is beauty plus female. Oh, shoot, I lost my page, there we go. Beauty plus female, 
And that's really not that much worse, right? Because that standard error three is minus four plus some, you know, the three standard error. That's not that's not enough probably to include the non-English. And what I should have done is just beauty um, because you did that and that seemed to capture a lot as well. I wonder if I have a minute to just try to see if I can run that real quick. Do I dare try? So like, how would you, are you just saying that anything within three standard deviations is not that bad? No, no. I mean, I guess I kind of am. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's within, almost within two standard deviations. It's with definitely almost within one standard deviation, just barely over one standard error away. That's not that significant is all I'm saying. I mean, that's kind of not very precise. But we could probably, do, you could probably do better. I'm just going to call this fit B because I ran out of the numbers. Was so if it was within one standard deviation, then that would be significant. Or more than five standard deviations is significant. I, yeah, I think you're right. If it's not, if it's only, I would say two standard deviations is enough to make it significant. But uh, one standard deviation, just over one standard deviation doesn't seem like that great of a difference to me. Okay, so more than two is... We put that up here. Then we should be looking at it. Yeah, no, then you would say that's probably a better, uh, it's probably significantly better model, right? So maybe I should pick that one, especially if it's simpler. Yeah. Right? You definitely want simp simpler, is generally better, right? We prefer parsimonious. Yeah, there you go. Offman's razor and all that. What did I do wrong? Blue B is not defined. You did not name it. Blue. Thank you. <laughs> I think it was Lou underscore. Oh, you're right. Thank Blue. you. Oh, you change it at the other side. I'll just change. I'll just match the other ones. Underscore is better, but now it's like lube. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Oh no, that see that's much that's worse. So certainly, uh, fit B is compared to fit three, which only included one more thing, right? Female. Yeah. Which is, was female. Yeah. Right. So and then we are comparing all this to the the scores that yeah. the evaluators gave. Yeah. So yeah. I'm definitely thinking just beauty is not enough, but beauty and female seems to be the best model going here, in my view. Okay, so I- you No, know, I'm just I curious about, I just, I just wanna try one more thing because you'll see why I do this in a second, but I'll we'll call this fit zero in my Can wonderful name. beauty? No. Or just female? It's one. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's the ultimate uh, baseline. Yeah. And then yeah, changing that to, you're right. Thank you. you. Yeah. I almost keep me honest here. Uh, wait, it's left with the last part. Yeah. All right, let's see. It. Did it actually run? Huh, it? No difference. No, it's something wrong here. Why is it coming twice? Yeah. Oh, you got to rerun lube. Oh, I think. thank you. You're right. You might have, yeah. I overrode it. All right, so fit zero is, is much worse. Okay, that's good. So beauty is better than fit zero, which is good. Yeah. So the reason fit why zero is every single uh, variable. No, fit zero it's is not, nothing. It's no basically variable. all you're doing is it's just the, the mean, just the mean. The mean. You're using okay. the mean evaluations yeah. of the score, you know, basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I told you I was doing. I'm trying to do my thesis. So I, I think the, the book I'm using the most is the statistical rethinking because Great book. He, oh, yeah. He, yeah, he advocates for the science first, then the statistics, right? So mm -hmm. I like yes. I like that. I concur with um, that 100%. So then if are we just doing confirmation bias? Because this is like use DAGs, get a model in your head that you feel is the best. So like for us, the model in our head that will be is like um, to the evaluators are scoring beauty, right? And then that's what they are scoring. The eval is beauty. No, so eval is uh, how much they like the course. Yeah. Oh, how much they like the course. Yeah. Huh. And we're trying to see but, does, do they are they biased by how but did, did you do beautiful female or, alone? What? Did you, did you do female alone? No, I did not. Let's see that. How much they like the course? Because like if I'm just using like causal, like 
what I really think I scientifically I want to test. I want to test, okay, between male and female, who gets the higher score values? I think my scientific thing is that maybe females might get the highest one. I just wanna, I'm just curious for the coefficient, so I'm gonna spit that out. Yeah, so, wait, female zero, baseline here is female, so not being a female, does this say that not being a female actually got a better valuation? Seems to, right? Yeah, because like when you did the the scatter plots. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. In the yeah. scatter plot, it did look like the males got slightly higher evaluations. Okay. So like for me, causally, I'm thinking gender has a higher. Um, but you notice that the, this model, just fitting the female, is not a very good model either compared to doing both female and beauty. So female beauty does yeah. a lot better than female by itself and then beauty by itself, for sure. Uh-huh. So like when you start with a causal, let's say you think that, oh, I'm just going to do like gender, right? Gender predicts how well, like the, the, yeah, your high- People like male evaluation. teachers better and, and all else being equal, yeah, type of conclusion, Yes. Right? So if, if I, I start with that, um why like would i be i i'm just kind of doing confirmation bias because you are trying to get information that proves that or or like you still have sure. a dag but you add yeah. other things in the dag i don't know you do you, you have, have to add in i mean it's important like you wouldn't just fit just female by itself you, even if you only cared about the female aspect you want to include the beauty maybe to help control for that because Right, when we fit both with beauty and female, because uh, we noticed okay. that, you know, it didn't it, we control for the beauty that we, we just make sure like, is there some impact of like, you know, more pretty or handsome, you know, instructors are gonna score better. We wanna make sure we control for that. And it, it doesn't really change the conclusion though that the males do score higher even on that case. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't, but that's kind of a different question. Here, we're just trying to look at this model comparison business. But I, but I do I do like your idea. Let's try to expand this discussion to more general things. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Ryan, I like, I, I, I'm thinking of all the, like we are in the section, we are about the confounds, like there's the fork, the right. pipe, the and I'm trying to understand, yeah. like, is, is this, because like, if you have a dog, you can have like, Beauty, uh, female goes into beauty, goes into, right. um, but I don't think that's, because there's some relation between beauty and female, yes, but I don't know, it's not like a, a causal like relationship, arrow, yeah. beauty doesn't cause me, and female doesn't cause you to be beautiful, so right. like the interaction, like what does that mean? Like, are you sort of controlling or? When I add the interaction, I just, honestly, I'm just throwing things in the model because this, this whole purpose of this is compared to different models. So I wasn't really thinking about it. I was just like, oh, let's try this. Let's try that. And this is not really the proper way to do it. I don't think scientifically. I was just, yeah. it, the, the problem said, try a lot of different models. So I try a few different models. So I tried a few different models. Now we tried even more, a few but, different models just for the fun of it. But. but how would you represent an interaction in a DAG form? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Because like, what does an interaction mean? That like some aspects of being female interacts with some aspects of being people or like? Well, the, in, the, in this context, we're just thinking that maybe beauty matters more, right? If you're a female than it does if you're a male. Like you maybe get a higher valuation okay, okay. if you're a female and you're beautiful, but not if you're male and you're beautiful. Maybe to be a handsome male doesn't really affect the evaluation as much, maybe. Maybe okay, because, so uh, you know, there's some gender bias yeah. in terms of that, right? So you're controlling for that interaction. Yeah, it turns out that wasn't, it didn't seem significant, at least in my very rough look at it, but. Okay, I think I, things are clearing up for, so thank you. No, no, this is what we're here for. Yeah. yeah.
Now, the last thing, 11.10, I did try this. I'm not convinced I, not convinced that I did it right. This was looking again at the same models that we did before, the same data, everything the same, except now we're gonna do, wants us to do our own manual k full validation. I did show how to do that before. Um, here, I was supposed to do a five-fold validation. So I did the same kind of thing I did before. They took the beauty and I assigned each of them a, you know, a shuffle of, of, of one through N. I just, here I did a different way for whatever reason. I wasn't sure there's some other way to do it because I wanted to, you know, get this to um, force recycling. So I just added zero the length of N and then, you know, added one folds. It does complain when I do that. It says, eh, but it works. So, <laughs> um, and then just shuffle it. So then I have random folds. Um, I yeah, This is done in a completely different way than I did the other one for some reason, I don't know why, different day. Um, so I calculate, a, for each fold, I calculate a data, right? My test training data, the ones that aren't in the fold, my test data, the ones that are in the fold. Um, this is just so I can see that things are happening. And then I fit, only fitting two different models here, actually three. I wanted to do that fit mean one, but it didn't work for some reason. I don't know why, so I just manually put the mean in here. So <clears throat> I'm fitting model one, which is beauty plus female, and fitting model three, which is beauty plus female plus non-English, where the data is the training data. And then I'm going to shove back in the, um, and notice I did this a different way too. I didn't use a row number, I did this method. I don't know what the right way to do this is. Um, I'm just going to shove the predictions back into the original tibble uh, for each case as a prediction. What is the what the prediction was for each fit, including as prediction zero. I'm calling the baseline where I just fit in the shove in the mean, right, over and over again for each each one of those things. So I do that, um, and it actually isn't too slow. I can run it right now. It'll just go, you know. There it goes, right? And the folds aren't exactly the same length. That's why I printed that out. I was curious about that. And then I can calculate then, what it asks us to do is to calculate the total uh, in the problem, I'm sorry, in the problem it says, for each model, add up the sum of the squares for the five steps and compare the different models based on this fit. So I'm comparing these three models based on the sum of the squares. And, you know, okay, without any knowing anything about the errors, it looks like model three again is better, right? Uh, has less sum of all the squared errors from the predictions on the auto sample. Um, but really the fits, the, the fits aren't, especially those two, aren't that different in terms of their predictions. Here I'm um, plotting the error between the prediction and the actual value for all the data points. You can see they're all mostly clustered up pretty closely, right? The blue and the green are the two models. One of them just leaves out non-English and they're not generally, they're sometimes a little bit different, but they're generally not that different. And even the mean is right there with them <laughs> in terms of the error. It's not that terrible. Uh, I guess we shouldn't be surprised to remember how that scatter plot was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty wide, right? A lot of scatter, a lot of unexplained variance in the model, in the data, I guess. I don't know. I, or I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, just to take another step further, I calculated the RMS for each fold. And yeah, you just don't see that the root mean square error for each fold. It's not that different. I mean, it's, it's hard to argue here that any of these models are that, either of these models is that significant of an effect. Just due to all the, the noise and the, the, the residual, uh, and what do you call it? Irreproducible, uh, irreducible error, right? Mm -hmm. the, is, is pretty big in the end. It's 0.5, remember it was 0.5 and the way up, I just remember that. There it is, right? There's the irreducible error. So all of our, I guess we should count the R squared. It's probably not very, very big here. <laughs> we haven't explained very much of the variance at all with any of these things. So we're talking about all this EPA. Sometimes it's good to go back to the original. It's good to plot things like this because you might be telling yourself these stories like, oh, we could, you know, definitely beauty has an effect, but mm. it has a, it has a significant effect, but it has no important effect <laughs> mm. on the scores, right? That's what we really have to come down to. I think we can actually see that on this original plot. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has okay. There's definitely a significant the slope here is, is there for sure, but it's not an important effect. Yeah, okay. it's mostly dominated by the the noise, which means there's other factors we didn't do. Like one of the most important factors probably is how good the instructor was, <laughs> right? 
in, in reality. So these other things, people, I would say, if I were doing this for real, I'd say, look, I don't think people are really heavily biased in their evaluations by any of these factors. Mm -hmm. Because none of these things explain much of the variance as, as much as the other thing. I should have counted the R squared, but anyway. Yeah. We're almost out of time. Um, yeah. What do you do? Do, uh, do you agree with my conclusions, though? Does that? Yeah. Sense? Yeah. I mean, for sure. You've, you've really taken this a long way, for sure. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to verify. I'm I'm doing. Uh, well, actually, are we meeting next week, or are we? No, we are on the two week uh, spring break. So get your keg on and. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, we're um, going to take a two week break. And then we'll come back. So you're. Oh, I'll be doing chapter twelve. Yeah. You'll be doing chapter twelve, and you'll be fully uh, rested in. Uh, yeah. One hundred percent well, and you'll be looking back on this time with. Yeah, I don't ever want to go through that again. Let me tell you. And I went through it too. Okay. Yeah, it's brutal. So hey, it's you brutal. guys are, are springing forward, right? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So 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 it will be one hour ahead for me then. Mm hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah something yeah. like, i don't i don't I, for me i also don't have, we don't have we're in arizona we don't do the daylight savings time so the time will change for me as well but i'll, I'll right. have two weeks to figure it out yeah anyway right. thank that. you that so was good to, much yeah. good discussion yeah great discussion really great job I enjoyed man that a lot and lots of things i need to get back to that statistical think rethinking book i have it here on my shelf and um I yeah. kind of abandoned it when I did the Bayes rules because we don't have a book club for it. But no, I mean, he, the, we'll have to do we'll have to do it, that again. It, we'll have to we should we should it, just re, we should re relaunch it. It's it, 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 it's a beast. Like seriously, yeah. it's like you, you like I watch it on uh, YouTube and then like one episode is like ah yeah, it, it's a lot. It's one of the, it's like similar like I was saying to him about the art, advanced art book. It's like you're watching the YouTube thing. Like okay, that's enough. Let's just stop here because I want to digest all that. I'm like, hit the pause button. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. It's always like, but wait a minute, there's more. No. <laughs> no. All well, right, guys. See, yeah. see you guys in, uh, in two weeks. Two yep. weeks. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you.